Hi, welcome back to Humanistic Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be number seven in a series dedicated to getting started in humanistic psychology. In the previous video in this series, we focused a whole lot on potential, which is basically an expression of how humanistic psychology sees us as fundamentally teleological beings, that is, beings who are oriented not only with respect to the past we've experienced and the present we are now experiencing, but also with respect to possibilities we project for ourselves into the future. We also looked a bit in the last video at the theme of openness, and that is going to be where we start off today. Because openness, and especially openness to our deeper possibilities and potentials, is a theme not only germane to our individual existence and also to our collective existence as participants in humanity, but also with respect to the project of psychology itself. So, humanistic psychology embodies a kind of openness to questioning what we would probably easily take for granted with respect to the project of psychology generally. And here are some things that would fall into that domain. So the idea that natural science and the paradigm of the natural sciences is the best way to study human beings. And the reason why that needs to be said is that, especially in American psychology, we've more or less taken that for granted for more or less the last century or so. So humanistic psychology embodies an openness to questioning that, even if it seems obvious that the paradigm of the natural science is perfectly adequate for studying the human psyche. Also, an openness to questioning that we already have the last word on how reality works. Okay, so humanistic psychology, as I've said repeatedly in this series of videos, attempts to be radical to get to the root in its way of questioning the reality and the dynamics of the human psyche. And uh, within sort of the orbit of that realization, it's hardly the case that we have the last word on how reality works. And I mean, think about it. Isn't that really just sort of a, boy, a moment of just <laughs> crazy hubris to think that, like we already sort of have fathomed the mystery of life that we already know uh, thoroughly, through and through, how reality works. Yeah, you know what? We're only getting started. <laughs> We're only getting started. Okay, and by the way, the other element of the hubris, we already have the last word on how reality works, and it works by way of deterministic causes and end of story. Oh, my goodness, aren't we full of ourselves? We already have the last word about what existence is. Okay, same kind of Thing. So humanistic psychology is opening to questioning what human beings are in terms of being. Because <laughs> as I said before, a human being is a kind of being. So questioning and interrogating uh, the meaning of existence and being is part of the openness of humanistic psychology. Also, uh, openness to questioning whether solving problems, that is to say utility, is psychology's ultimate destination and value, like the ultimate purpose of doing psychology is to solve problems. And here again, I should probably repeat the thing I said, when was it, like two videos ago about this, that solving problems is inevitably an important part of life. Everyone understands that. That's not up for debate, okay? The question is, what else is going on? because there's a lot more to life than just solving problems, okay? The other part to life is, uh, you know, extending ourselves sort of beyond the norm and, and uh, you know, experiencing the real depth of life. And like I said in the last video, coming into our deeper possibilities, okay? It's not just a matter of trying to rise to the, some kind of acceptable norm. It's all about exceeding norms, too. All right, so in this regard, in this openness to questioning things in a fairly radical way, in a way humanistic psychology tries to out-science science, <laughs> if you think about it. And why is that? Well, it's for the reason that I mentioned, I think, three videos ago or thereabouts, that it wants to question the very foundations that natural science and natural science approaches to psychology tend not to want to question very much. Because natural science approaches to psychology tend not to want to ask questions about the fundamental nature of existence or being or reality or any of these other questions that humanistic psychology is fairly eager to ask about. Okay, so 
in that regard, it wants to outscience science. Why? Because the animating spirit of science is to question everything. And the fact is that the more fundamental the question is, like, what is the nature of existence, the more important it is to ask about it from the perspective of science. So that's this contradiction that we noticed a few videos ago about, you know, how, how it is that science tends not to want to ask about the constructs that are forming the very foundation of the enterprise, despite the fact that its ethic is to subject everything to question and not simply to assume we already know the answer before we've even asked the question. Seems kind of crazy. But uh, as you may have detected, and I'm thinking you have detected it by now in this series of videos, uh, these kinds of questions definitely start to sound philosophical. Okay, so questions about the nature of reality, questions about the nature of existence, they tend to sound more like a mode of philosophy than a way of doing experiments in a laboratory somewhere. And once again, we've, I know we've talked about this before, but here it is again, that's true. That humanistic psychology does tend to feel and sound in a way much more like a kind of hybrid of psychology and philosophy rather than a hybrid of psychology and chemistry, let's say, okay, or biology or something like that. All right, so that brings us up to the point where we begin to inquire into where humanistic psychology actually came from. So we're going to spend a few minutes drawing out uh, the historical lineage, as it were, of humanistic psychology. So first thing you ought to know, humanistic psychology arose in, well, I said it in your notes, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and probably sort of the central target area, if you wanted to sort of name the point of origin of humanistic psychology would probably be the 1960s here in the United States. Okay, so humanistic psychology is a distinctly American way of doing psychology, although it is definitely informed by several movements within uh, European thought and more specifically continental European thought, as we'll see. I don't know if we'll get that to that this video or we'll have to save it for the next one, but at any rate, uh, when you think of the point of origin of humanistic psychology, Think of uh, the 1960s in the United States. And here you have to, uh, I guess, uh, remember something that you saw perhaps on TV uh, about what was going on in the United States during the 1960s. So this was the hippie era, right? So a lot of things within, with respect to the uh, the, the culture of the United States were shifting in some pretty fundamental ways, like young people especially, like people in their 20s for the most part, you know, people more or less the same age that you are now in the 1960s were questioning, man, they were questioning a lot of the ways of life and mores and uh, values that they were handed and doing it in a pretty fundamental way. Like they were questioning, um, you know, uh, race relations for one thing. Okay, so we had the civil rights movement. Okay, it started in the 50s, but it was definitely going in the 60s for sure. Uh, they were questioning uh, sexuality in various ways, you know, whether heterosexual sexual uh, sexuality done in the missionary position for the purposes of procreation was the be-all end all of our sex lives. Okay, they were questioning uh, what states of consciousness were permissible. Okay, and I don't want to get too detailed about that because I'll probably get censored from YouTube or something like that. But uh, let's give you a second to use your imagination. They were questioning what states of consciousness are permissible. Okay, Think back to what you know about the 60s. They were questioning whether the government is always tells you the truth with respect to, let's say, the Vietnam War, that the Vietnam War is justified and noble and all of that kind of stuff. And so they were questioning many things in many deep ways. Oh, fashion. Like they were questioning things even in how you're you can look as a human being like, uh, you know, 1960s before that, it was pretty damn rare to see a male with long hair. Okay, you know, um, so maybe I should, since I need a haircut, maybe I can have a visual aid for a second. They were questioning whether males could have long hair or not. Of course, mine's due to the coronavirus, so I, I, I really can't sort of lay claim to sort of hippiedom or whatever at this point. But they were questioning that. They were walking around with new styles like beads and uh, dashikis and uh, sandals. And uh, a dashiki, by the way, is... Uh, a sort of uh, a very fancy African type 
shirt, all right? So the, you know, Nehru jackets, so that came from India. So they were questioning all these sorts of things. Questioning music, obviously. Rock and roll music was a huge uh, part of this cultural ferment of the uh, 1960s. And in the midst of that ferment, in the midst of that kind of questioning of orthodoxies, and uh, you know, sort of uh, the historical inertia from the past that was carrying things forward, questioning all of that, along comes humanistic psychology to do a very similar kind of questioning with respect to the orthodoxies that defined psychology at the time. Okay, so what are the orthodoxies that were defining especially American psychology at the time? Well, there were two dominant forces within psychology at the time and for a long time leading up to that. One of them had to do with psychoanalysis. Okay, so this is the school of psychological thought that ultimately derives from Freud and Freudian insights and at the center of psychoanalysis is the idea of the unconscious. And okay, different psychoanalytic thinkers have different ideas about how the unconscious is structured and what its fundamental dynamisms are. Freud had a, a very uh, sexualized view of how the unconscious works. Uh, Carl Jung had a very archetypal view of what the, con the unconscious is about. Um, Karen Horney had a different view and so on down the line. There were different psychoanalytic thinkers, but still they all are circulating around this idea of the unconscious. Okay, so that's the first force, as it were, in American psychology. The second force had to do with behaviorism. And here, um, we should probably note that it's old school behaviorism, not the sort of cognitive behavioral amalgam that we know today in the 21st century. That's the main expression of behaviorism today is in the form of cognitive behaviorism, but old school pure behaviorism. Okay, so Skinnerian, type behaviorism. And, uh, you know, so the, the question is, well, why would anyone want to question all of that? Well, here's why people wanted to question all of that in the 1960s, in this, in this uh, context of cultural ferment that was inviting people to question all kinds of things. So uh, the reason why they question psychoanalysis is that psychoanalysis almost always focuses on how people are broken and stuck and pathological in various ways. And of course, <laughs> kind of as we saw just a few minutes ago, that leaves the other half of life unexamined, more or less. So the problem with, with psychoanalysis is not that it isn't good enough at examining the problems people have. The problem with psychoanalysis is it's pretty much exclusively focused on that at the expense of the other half of life. And the other half of life, as I said a few minutes ago, has to do not only with like how can you reach, sort of rise up to the extent where you can live sort of a normal, reasonably acceptable life, but how can you extend yourself beyond that and rise up into the deeper possibilities and potentials of your life? Okay, I said that word potentials in a dramatic way because it's hearkening back to the last video. Okay, so that was the problem that these early humanistic psychological thinkers had with psychoanalysis. The problem they had with behaviorism, in a way, is also a principle of exclusion. So old school behaviorism kind of went like this. The only proper topic matter for the science, and by science I mean a natural science approach, approach to psychology, the only proper topic matter for that is what you can directly observe about human beings. And the only thing you can directly observe about human beings is how they behave. Okay. You know, so the, which basically boils down to how their bodies move. All the other stuff, in other words, thoughts that you would have in your interiority or feelings you would have in your interiority or values or your sense of spirituality or anything like that is not proper topic matter for psychology because according to the pure behaviorist, psychology is ipso facto by the fact itself a science. And the only proper topic matter for science is stuff that you can directly and objectively view in the world. And all of the elements of subjectivity, like your experience and all of that, you cannot directly observe. Therefore, it's excluded. And so these early humanistic psychologists, of course, objected to that. They were very much interested in things like exploring values and meanings and experience and all the elements of your supposedly interior subjective experience. So basically, humanistic psychology rose up in that cultural ferment as 
the third force psychology, and I put that phrase in quotes in your notes because that's a fairly common phrase you'll encounter. Like if you read articles about humanistic psychology and all of that stuff, you'll still encounter that phrase today. So um, you ought to know that it's a sort of coded way of talking about humanistic psychology. And of course, the first two forces are the ones we just got done describing. So psychoanalysis, right? You know, and then behaviorism are the first two forces. So humanistic psychology is the third force in American psychology. Now, part of what you have to realize is there's sort of two elements of motivation, the first of which we've just got done describing. So part of what motivated the early humanistic psychologists was uh, a kind of uh, negative motivation, but I don't mean the word negative in the sense of being bad. It's negative in the sense of they're just reacting against something. What's the something? The state of psychology at the time. Okay, dominated by psychoanalysis and behaviorism. All right, so they're reacting against that. So part of the, their motivation was a kind of negative motivation. But the other part of humanistic psychology's early motivation was more positive. And I don't mean positive in the sense of being good, but positive in the sense that they were, they were seeking out something for its own inherent value. It's not just that they were trying to move away from something else. They were also moving towards something. Well, what's the something? Well, the something is grappling with the riddle of the human psyche and human existence in a much more direct, honest, and inclusive way than had been done up to that point in time. All right, so two sides to humanistic psychology's motivation. So there was this uh, early emphasis on experience and starting to uh, interrogate the meaning of life phenomenologically. Ooh, there's that word again. Might have to remember what that means. Okay, so in other words, in terms of looking at experience, everyday experience, and trying to illuminate the, the, uh, the meanings inherent in our everyday experience. So what is life in terms of our experience? What are human beings about? Okay, well, like I keep saying every now and then in these videos, human beings are a type of being. <laughs> Okay, you're probably getting sick of hearing that. I'm sorry if you are. Actually, I'm not sorry because that means you're understanding it, probably. So human being is a kind of being. But then, what is being? Okay, so uh, that's the kind of question that it's easy to think you know the answer to until someone starts asking you about it in a serious way. It turns out that that's a much trickier question than it seems like at first you know it's it's sort of a it's almost an embarrassing question when you think about it it's like because you're you've been in a state of being let's say you're 20 years old you've been in a, in a state of being and more specifically a human state of being for the last 20 years and it can be sort of embarrassing to uh, to realize that you don't really know what the hell's going on with respect to it that it's you know it's sort of a weird incongruity, as it were, to realize that it's much easier to tell someone about something of monumentally inconsequential importance, <laughs> like like how to sign on to YouTube. It's like, well, you write like www.youtube.com on this little bar up here, and then you hit the return key, and that puts you on YouTube. Like, it's so easy to tell someone something like that, but when someone wants to know sort of the deep meaning of being, it can be sort of an embarrassment to realize, well, you know, I've been alive for, in my case, 60 years, so it's even more embarrassing than in your case, and I'm still sort of trying to figure that out. But the embarrassment, of course, is that the thing that you're in all the time is the thing that's hardest to talk about. <laughs> you know, and the thing that is just so fleeting and unimportant is the easy thing to talk about. Okay, so uh, as I say in your notes, this kind of questioning made humanistic psychology more open to incorporating philosophical type insights than natural science psychology typically does. Okay, so humanistic psychology is going to be open, there's that theme again, to incorporating uh, not just philosophical insights, although philosophical insights are the most obvious case in point, but even uh, insights that come to us from literature, let's say, because sometimes people who are writing literature also have important 
insights into the human psyche. They also fairly often, fairly frequently, have tremendous psychological insights. So why shouldn't psychology uh, seek to incorporate those insights into its own project? Or even, you know, artists like, you know, how many tremendous uh, psychological insights have you heard in the lyrics of music, let's say? You know, like uh, I was just talking to my wife um, the other day, I think it was yesterday, and I said, uh, I was quoting the song by the Eagles, Lion Eyes, and I said, every form of refuge has its price. And she recognized it, of course, instantly. We're both musicians, all right? So she, it's hard to get one past her, you know? It's like, yeah, that's the Eagles. I'm like, yeah, like, dude, that's, um, a tremendous psychological insight, really, like every form of refuge Every place that you would seek to escape to exacts its price on you. Okay, what a tremendous psychological insight. So uh, the domain of arts and uh, musical expression, like why wouldn't psychology seek to incorporate psychological insights that come to us by way of the arts into its project? Well, the thing is that traditional um, mainstream psychology hardly ever does that. Every now and then it does, hardly ever, not that often. But humanistic psychology is sort of eager to do that. Like, like it is very friendly with artistic, creative type people and wants to welcome them into the project. Yeah, let's understand life together. Why should we, why should we separate ourselves out from what y'all are doing? Like there's, that just seems so freaking arbitrary and capricious to do that. Not to mention probably self-destructive at some level. Okay, so uh, let's end this video uh, at this point and in the next uh, video we're going to take up. The next one's going to be a little on the demanding side because we're going to get into more of the, the details. There's going to be a fair amount of specialized vocabulary in the next one. More of the details about uh, this intersection between um, this, this budding uh, uh, upsurge of interest in a new form of psychological inquiry, humanistic psychology, and movements within European philosophy that began to inform it at the origin point of its history. But until then, have a great day. I hope you have a good one. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, think about the fact that the question of being is a lot more important than it might seem at first. Take care.